do you do when you walk into a room? I kind of gave away the answer a little bit ago what I would do. If you were to walk into a room and there's like 100 people, 200 people, and you don't know any of them, what do you do in that situation? I discovered that there's normal people and non-normal people. The normal people, the normal people quietly walk in, stay to the side, don't do their best to not disrupt anything because this is a very stressful experience for most normal people. Then I feel like there's some people out there, you may be one of them, who this is not a stressful experience for you. This is fun. <laughs> this is exciting. For you, a stranger is not a stranger. It's just a friend who doesn't know they're my friend yet. <laughs> we love you. We think you need therapy, but that's fine. As a normal person, my, every fiber in my body, when I go in this situation, wants to hide in the corner. But sometimes, what I discovered, oftentimes, God tells me to do the exact opposite. This is probably like two months ago, something like that. My daughter started a new school. She's in high school now. She started a new high school. And they were having this event on a Saturday night for like the parents to get to know one another. <laughs> so this has like Marianne written all over it. I don't usually go to these events, okay, because like I don't go to these events, okay? But Marianne, for some reason, couldn't be there. So she needed me to go. I didn't want to go because A, I don't want to go. B, it's a Saturday night. Saturday nights for priests. Like, you know that like you have this big presentation where you have to give it work and you like for like a week in advance, like get a good night's sleep. That's me every Saturday, okay? So every Saturday I have like a big presentation to give on Sunday morning. So I don't need to be going out to social events on a Saturday night especially without my wife. But apparently, if we didn't go, our daughter would be ostracized for the rest of her eternity because her parents didn't show up at this social event. So for the love of my daughter, I had to show up at this event. I showed up. It was in somebody's backyard. There was like 200 people in that backyard. I knew nobody. And Marianne wasn't there. Every fiber in my being wanted to just go like this, go, oh, excuse me. <laughs> and just walk back to my car. But inside, I felt God saying, no, I want you to be here. And note, I'm missing church. We have church service on Saturday night. So actually, I'm missing church. So I had every excuse to leave, but I knew God wanted me to be there. I'm super awkward. I'm just like, I'm the, um, super awkward. Some guy comes over to me. Either it was A, a pity conversation, or B, a security conversation, okay? I don't know which one of the two it was, but he came over and started talking to me. Either he had mercy on me, he saw like I didn't fit, or he was just like, you know, who's the new guy who's dressed, you know, like that, okay? <laughs> Either way, I had like a two-minute conversation with some guy. He checked me out. He let me go. This gave me a little bit of confidence, and then all of a sudden, I said, I know God wants me to be here, and then I made contact, eye contact with another couple who looked just as awkward and uncomfortable as I was feeling on the inside. So I went over and said hello to them. And I went over there and had a discussion. And I discovered that one of them was Ethiopian. Okay. And I said, oh, you know, are you Orthodox? And then, you know, when someone was like raised Orthodox and left the church, it's that awkward, like, yeah. And I'm like, I get it. That's fine. Like, you know, no problem. Like, I'm not here to judge. I'm just, you know. So she's Ethiopian. He's not. They were married. And I said, do you go to church? Someone like that. And we had a nice, friendly conversation. They don't go to church, but they're looking for a church. And I'm like, you're in luck. <laughs> that's like what I do and I'm having this nice conversation and of course I invite them to church five minutes later my wife walks in she says my wife walks in and I'm with this couple she goes straight up and she's like hey you know Jill or I don't know what the lady's name was lo and behold they went to college together and they knew each other and then Mary Ann see I'm nice like you should come to church Mary Ann's like no you need to come to church this Sunday and you need to be at this time and we invited them to church and they haven't come But I wanted specifically to tell you a story of that, okay? Because what I want to say is this. I don't care whether they come or not. Of course, I care like I want them to come. <laughs> but my point is, my job was not to bring them to Christ. My job was what? To bring Christ to them. And that's why the third practical step is we need to be willing 
to be the next link in the chain. Be the next link in the chain. Be the next link in the chain. Did you know that every single person has a certain number of links in the chain? I told you the story about the guy who invited me to Michigan. Don't think that he's the only reason. There's a chain of conversations, a chain of events that need to take place. And let's just put a number to it. Let's say there needs to be 175 conversations. And God knows that 174 people asked me and invited me to events before. And I was so rude to many of them. And I blew them off. And I didn't have anything to do with them. But number 38 did his job. So then 39 could do their job. And then 40 and then 41. And my question to you is, are you willing to just be number 73? in a link in a chain of 178. Are you willing just to do your job? Because if you don't do your job, the next person can't do their job. And it all builds on each other. All we need to do, don't baptize them. Please don't baptize them. Don't cast out demons. Okay, don't send them to the monastery. Just be the next link. Just be the next link. St. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter three. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Saying it's like farming. You may not be the one to bring the fruit, but the guy, the fruit, needs the person to water. It needs the person to break up the soil. It needs the person to plant the seed. I think I did those in the wrong order, but you know what I'm trying to say. Like, are you willing just to be the guy who breaks up the rough soil? You didn't bring any fruit, but you made it so the other guy could plant. And you can, are you willing to be the planter? And then the other guy's going to water it. And the other guy's going to fertilize. And then some schmuck shows up at the end and brings forth the fruit. But come on, it's not him. It's a chain. Are you willing to be the next link in the chain? Because the bottom line, if it is done out of love for God, if it is done out of obedience to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, it will never be a failure. Whether they come to church or don't come to church, whether they ever repent or don't repent, if it's done out of love for God, there is a reward. The reason I'm preaching this message today is because next week we're doing something we haven't done in a long time, and that's called Friends and Family Day. And Friends and Family Day, for those who remember in the prehistoric times before COVID, we used to do Friends and Family Day three, four times a year. And Friends and Family Day is very simple. This is our way of practicing a personal call to evangelism. We're making it easy for you. And we're saying on this particular Sunday, okay, and again, we do it throughout the year. We haven't done it throughout COVID. Well, on this particular Sunday, every single person, your job is to pray, to step out of your comfort zone, and to pray and seek out the Spirit's promptings and be willing to invite someone to church, at least one person. I don't care if they come or not. Like you may invite 10 people and none of them show up and someone else didn't invite someone and then someone invited themselves. to. It's not about the results, but it's about me being willing to take a step into the discomfort zone to pray and seek out God. Is there anyone in my life that you want me to invite? Anyone you want me to approach? And then just simply taking the next step and being the next link in the chain. We're starting a series next week. It's called Relationship Hacks. We're doing this series because this is the easiest series on the planet to invite someone to. Someone who may not care about the Bible, someone who not care about the church, but I promise you, if they've been alive these past two years, they would love, love, love to hear a series about how to improve their relationships. And especially what we're going to talk about is about how I, I mentioned this earlier when I, when I announced it after the liturgy, is starting relationships is easy. Everyone knows how to do that. But where we struggle is fixing them. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to be relationship mechanics next week. We're going to talk about how anyone can buy a new car, anyone can start a new relationship, anyone can do anything like that. But what happens when there's some problems in it? We're going to talk about it every single week for five weeks. And it's the easiest thing to invite people to. Now here's, I'm even making it even easier for you. In case you're still, this is awkward, you do the following. You go to this person that God put on your heart and you say, a priest in my church, he's a difficult man. He's a very difficult man. He said he's not going to let me in the doors unless I invite someone to come with me to church on Sunday. So for my sake, get him off my back. You want to come with me to church. And maybe the, if the lunch thing works out for you, that's kind of on you. There ain't no budget for that in my household, but if that's on you. But at least give God a chance. Because like my friend who invited me to Michigan, you never know the results. You never know the results. You never know the results. Can we read this together one last time? Personal call to evangelism, STSA family. It means what? What is it that we believe? We believe 
that the call to evangelism and witnessing applies to us just as much as it did to the apostles in the early church. God will hold me accountable to its completion. Look, it's been a tough couple of years for a lot of people. It's been a tough couple of years for a lot of people. And I'm not just talking about physically. Of course, there's been a lot of physical suffering, but I see a much greater suffering, and that is the emotional and spiritual suffering that I see running rampant across people today. And I'm telling you, the stuff I see, like so many people before the pandemic struggled with fear and anxiety. So many people did. And it was just like something that people struggle with and we work on it, but it's, it's, God does not want us to live in fear. What this pandemic did, what this pandemic did is it multiplied that. And I'm telling you, I visit, I'm not judging, but I'm telling you, I visit families. Okay, I see kids. Okay, we were visiting a family, a kid probably four, five, six, eight, something like that who like, I went down just to say hello to him. He was scared and he said, am I gonna get COVID? Like he was asking his mom, like, is it okay to say hi to this man? Am I gonna get COVID? And I'm talking about that poor little kid. Like we're at the point where we're almost gonna do irreversible damage. Okay, what we do to our children. I, I, I know people, and again, I'm not judging. Please, if you're watching this, I'm not judging you, but I'm telling you, it's not healthy. I know people who haven't left the home for three or four weeks now because they're just so scared. And I'm telling you, that's not gonna fix itself. That's not gonna fix itself. Fear is never the answer. Fear is never how God wants us to live. And I'm telling you, what we have here in the church is exactly what people out there need, which is a chance to live free from the enslavement of fear and anxiety and stress. And I'm saying, enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. It's time for us to bring back evangelism because here we have what people need. People need less news. People need less media. People need more word of God. People need less things that fill with fear. People need more things that fill with faith. People need less isolation from one another. People need more fellowship with one another. People need less life alone and more life as part of the greatest family ever. And you may be the link to help someone find it. So I hope you'll do your job this week and say a prayer and seek out who God may be calling you to invite to church and we'll give God a chance to do something great. Oh, 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 oh,